Finally tonight, the analysis of Shields and Brooks, that is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. So jobs numbers, Mark, uh, unemployment rate is uh, down. Uh, the best numbers, I guess, uh, they, they've seen in, since this president took office. Since February, that's right. February. What does it all mean for the presidential campaign? It's it's encouraging. It's good news. And it's upbeat for the for the president for the country first of all, but certainly for the Obama administration. I think that uh, you've seen uh, this sort of uh, increasing, better than expected jobs numbers now the second month in a row, and uh, I think it's reflected in the president's support. You can see his own numbers improving. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it, people feel better about the country. There was a sense, I think, a couple of months ago, things were spiraling down. Uh, and uh, that sense, not in totally gone away, but feel better about the country, feel better about the way things are going. And one of the good pieces of news is not because we have some massive stimulus going out there to pump things up, it's the business cycle. Uh, and so the business cycle is ticking upwards. And as all the economists say, that doesn't mean it's going to continue. The CBO came out this week, mm -hmm. the Congressional Budget Office, right. with a projection that next year or the rest of the year is going to be down. And then looming out there always is Europe. When you talk to people who are doing the following the European situation full time, a lot of anxiety there. So we, we've we had a false dawn before. We, this could be another one. On the other hand, this could be the slow, gradual climb out of what we've been through. How much does it matter, Mark, uh, how the Republican nominee candidates still handle this. I mean, today they were pretty much universally saying, well, the president should be doing better, should, be, should have done more. They, uh, they were. You, you almost wanted to say, uh, cheer up, fellas, eventually things will get worse. I mean, they, they, were, you know, they were really sort of discouraged or upset that there was good news. I mean, there's still, Judy, 5.6 million fewer jobs today than there were when the Great Recession began in December 2007. I mean, so we've got a long way to go. But this, this is good news. It's encouraging. And it means that the Republicans have to come up with something other than we're the other guys. I mean, they have to come up with some vision, and whatever Mitt Romney's strengths have been, vision has not been one of them up to now. Yeah, I, I just completely want to underscore that. First, on the policy sense, it lessens the need probably for a little more stimulus. It increases the need for long-term unemployment policies, mm -hmm. because that issue is still very strong. Which is we something still, that uh, Congress is dealing with right, right now. And so we still have this huge number of long-term unemployed. But the idea that Mitt Romney, assuming he's the nominee, can coast to the presidency on bad economy while, you know, just uttering banalities about how much he loves America, that's probably not going to happen now. If the economy continues to take up, he can't just ride the economy. It's much more, much more philosophical, much more substantive about how he differs with the president. So so how much of this is, is the president just simply at the mercy, David, of these numbers that come out in the first week of every month? And how much of is how he talks about it? Well, we, we cover campaigns and we, they all say, I created this jobs, I created that jobs. The extent to which a president is responsible for the economy under his watch, we should emphasize this. We all, it will help him politically, but it's completely bogus. Presidents do not control the economy under their watch. They can have a marginal impact in extraordinary circumstances, but it has to do with a lot more complicated things than they're responsible for. Uh, and that's true with Obama, that's true with Bush, it's true probably with Herbert Hoover. Uh, the, the presidents do not co co correlate in the short term with economic quarterly by quarterly performance. So he just has to wake up every, the first Friday yeah. of every month and hope that the numbers well, are good. I, I, think, I think the president did take dramatic, bold, controversial steps. And uh, I think he can make the case that uh, he what he did is working. Um, there, were, there were major policy changes that, that were at the outset of his administration. Right now, there are very few arrows left in his quiver of what he can do. And uh, so in that sense, and I think, just to underscore what David said about Europe and what uh, we had in the previous uh, discussion with Ray. I mean, uh, Iran, Iran is yeah. the wild card. I mean, if we're talking about the Strait of Hormuz being closed or something of that sort, that, that's, a, that's a game changer politically. Well, let's keep it here at home a few more minutes, okay. David, and that is uh, uh, the Mitt Romney comments this week where he said, uh, I'm not concerned about the very poor, and he went on to talk about it, about a safety net. At first he said, um, this is taken out of context, and then yesterday, as we heard from John, John Ralston, Austin. he said, I misspoke. Um, what, what do we know f more about yeah. Mitt Romney from this episode? Well, first, he's following the, the strategy that every candidate since maybe Bill Clinton or maybe before, with the exception of George W. Bush, has followed, which is just pay attention to the middle class. 
and they all focus on the middle class. And w as a result, with the, again, the potential exception of George W. Bush, we've had no national candidate talk about poverty for a long, long time, <laughs> maybe decades. Uh, the second thing we learned including about... Including the president. Including the current president. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and the, the second thing we learned is, I understand what he's trying to say, but to have the words, I do not care about the poor, come out of your mouth, say that you are responding to reality in an abstract, dehumanized way, the way a consultant would, not as a human being would. People who are in touch, who are see the electorate as human beings, those words would not come out of your mouth. And so to that extent, I do think it touches a genuine problem for Romney, which is he sometimes sees things in a much more distanced, emotionally distanced way. And as a result, people think, well, I'm not sure he gets what I'm going through. Does this connect, Mark, to the other comments that have been highlighted, that, you know, the, the $10,000 bet? Uh, I'm, the un I'm unemployed, too. I'm unemployed, uh, Right, and I was afraid of a pink slip. Um, it does, Judy. What, what you have to be worried about is that uh, a perception, a negative perception, can start to set in that becomes a caricature. I mean, take the case, for example, of President Gerald Ford. Perhaps the best athlete ever to sit in the White House, a University of Michigan football player drafted by the NFL, but he slipped coming down the stairs and he drove a, a golf ball into a crowd and all of a sudden he was a klutz and Chevy Chase had a career. And that became the perception. Mitt Romney is now coming across as a guy who was born in a log cabin in Gross Point, Michigan with silver earplugs. I mean, he doesn't hear. I mean, it really, it's setting in, and I, I think Republicans you talk to are getting nervous that perhaps this guy just doesn't have the touch. I mean, it's not a silver spoon, it's silver earplugs. I mean, he really is tone deaf. So, so but he's, he's now saying, I misspoke. Yeah, I mean, I mean can well, he put this behind him? Uh, and, and Well, I mean, to, to be blunt about it, what, whatever else he says about the safety net, I mean, very little of his campaign has been devoted to extending, repairing, and strengthening the safety net. I mean, that has not been a priority of the, of the Republican platform or of Mitt Romney's agenda. I mean, so that was, that was kind of a silly statement to make in, in passing, uh, even as he tried to, I mean, the middle class has become the holy grail of American politics. I mean, whatever you do for the middle class of these, you do for me, I think scripture's gonna be re rewritten. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, it becomes shameless on the part of Democrats and Republicans, and that's what he was trying to do ineptly, though he did it. Do you think we're gonna hear more focus on the poor, the very poor? I hope, I mean, he, yeah. can, he can have a policy. Maybe this is a, would be a good antidote. I don't expect them to do this, but say, okay, here's my poverty agenda. We believe in equal opportunity, but providing equal opportunity, the government just can't hang back when you've got all these disorganized neighborhoods. You actually got to do some stuff, and I'm going to help charities. I'm going to do this. Uh, and so he, it would be behoove him to have a policy agenda toward poverty. We have a greater number and percentage of people very poor today than we've had in a generation. There are 20 million Americans living in households less than one half of the poverty rate established by the government. So that would be an income for a family of four, about $11,000 a year. So, I mean, it, it is a real problem. So, uh, final thing I want to ask you, two developments this week around uh, social, sensitive social issues. One was a Susan Komen Foundation changing course on money for Planned Parenthood. And the other one had to do with something that came out of the health uh, health uh, agency this week. But let, let me ask you about the second. First, the Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of Health for the Obama administration, announced that social service providers have to include contraceptives in their health coverage, whatever a group's uh, religious or ethical mm -hmm. views are. Mark, what's the fallout from this? The, the fallout is uh, cataclysmic uh, for the White House and for the president. Um, really? Yes, cataclysmic. I mean, I, I'm not talking about, and I say this as a Catholic, uh, I'm not talking about Catholics who attend Mass every Sunday. Catholics who take, attend Mass irregularly take great pride in the social mission of the Catholic Church to provide, to feed the hungry, to provide shelter for those who are homeless, to, to take care of those who are lonely and the immigrant. And there's a great sense of pride that this is the mission of the Catholic Church. It's part of the definition of the Catholic Church. And uh, what, what President Obama has done with this policy, and Secretary Sebelius, quite bluntly, is they have taken those Catholics who took a risk to support them, 
uh, Father John Jenkins, the president of Notre Dame, and Sister Carol Keenan, who's the president of the Catholic Health Association, and Father Larry Snyder, who's president of Catholic Charities, who had taken on orthodox, orthodox more conservative groups within their own Catholic Church to support the president, especially his efforts on the poor, and he's left them out to dry. I mean, he really has, with, and just a policy that I think is quite frankly indefensible. So what are the implications? Yeah, I agree. I think that's enormous. I think it's the most underreported story of many months because you have Catholics who are upset. You have evangelicals who are really upset and whatever problem they had with Mitt Romney, that has now healed. Mm -hmm. now united with Mitt Romney because they're so upset about uh, this story. And a lot of people think we are a diverse country. We have a lot of different values. The government should get involved. It gives money to a lot of these associations. But it should give different people with different values the ability to operate in the way they see fit. When you have uh, the the government saying one size fits all, sort of a form of bureaucratic greed, you're going to do it our way or not, well, then that insults a lot of people. And so I, I think this is uh, having resonance across the country. It was utter, uh, statements were issued on a lot of masses, a lot of pulpits of this past Sunday. And, you know, I think it's going to have a, a significant lingering effect for a long time. Why did the administration do it then? I, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I think there was a tone deafness. I think uh, maybe the Mitt Romney thinks contagious. Uh, I mean, there the, the, the just really was. I mean, this was after the president in private conversations and a public speech at, at the commencement address at Notre Dame had said, we're going to work out a, a compromise. We'll work this out. We'll have a solution that respects the, the conscience. I mean, the conscience clause is deep in our tradition. It's Quakers at time of war. It's Seventh-day Adventists not being forced to work on the, on the Sabbath. It's Orthodox Jew, Jews being g given uh, kosher food. It, uh, uh, it, it's, you know, it just really, uh, it, to me, I, I don't know. I mean, you can make a political calculation, but I, I honestly don't know why they did it. Do you have a sense of why? No, and it's a great mystery. I, I hear uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, who switched the president's mind? Who would have the power to change his mind after he'd made these vows? Uh, I don't know. I really think they should come out and address it a little more because it's not getting some of the front page coverage that I think it deserves, but uh, it's it's out there. And, but but you, you, you're you hearing that they may reverse? No, no, no. I don't no. mean to say that. There's... I mean to say that there's a lot of popular upset about this. And within the administration, by the way, there's some upset about uh, this. Uh, Judy, I mean, places like Scranton, Pennsylvania, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, the I-4 car, car, I mean, Catholics and those, I mean, Barack Obama carried Catholics with 54% in 2008. I'm, you know, okay. I'm just saying that this is, appears to be distancing, if not dissing Catholics. We hear you both. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you. Thank you.